thank you first of all very much for coming here tonight. This is the opening of uh, our show for the Head-On Festival, part of the Head-On Festival, which is here in backstage with Daniel Schumann and Thomas Kellner. And we are, are very, very happy to have both artists here from Germany, though Thomas is leaving us already tomorrow. And Daniel has a few more days, and I'm glad the weather has turned, right? <laughs> Otherwise, they just go back to Germany and say, God, it's been raining. <laughs> um, we have here tonight speaking for you, um, Moshe Rosenzweig and uh, Arpad, Dr. Arpad Stölder from the Goethe Institute, and both artists. And um, so that means uh, you're going to get another invitation very shortly to Ingo Bracke with his enchanted forest, or in, uh, yeah, the, enchant the magic forest enchanted <coughs> landscape. So there is another opportunity for you to come next week. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Moshe Rosenzweig, uh, the director of the Head On Festival, just to say a few words. He is actually the one who turned up with Arpad the director of the Goethe Institute, and said, Connie, could we do an exhibition during the Head-On Festival? I got to know those amazing artists um, in Germany, and uh, that's where Moshe sort of sourced them. I, I don't know what occasion that was, but uh, he knew them before me, and they suggested this project to do that at this time now, and, and there it is. It's become a reality, so fantastic. Thanks, Moshe, for coming, because I know you're very busy. <laughs> Hi, good evening. I've got not much to say, so I'll be, I'll be very brief. I did meet uh, the two guys actually in China, in a oh. festival in China. Sorry. <laughs> um, and we met, I think Daniel I met first time last year, and he actually made me cry with the project. Not this one, there's another project that this one was emotional, but... <coughs> I could hold it with this one. There's another one coming up that is very powerful. Um, and Thomas I met the year before already, so we are now we're going back a long way. <coughs> so, so there's a little bit of a community there. Alistair was there as well. There's quite a few people that go to China every year. To, it's a small, well, it's a big festival <coughs> in a small town in uh, China. So. <coughs> There's a lot of stuff that happens there, and people work <laughs> together, and kind of, there's good exchanges that happen there. Arpad, I know, I've known for a long time. He, he keeps talking to me in Hebrew. And you speak to me in English. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I try to practice my Hebrew. <laughs> and we tried we try to do something the last couple of years and didn't work, because the way we, we operate, because we are annual festival, we usually sort of pushing the deadlines quite a lot and being coming from the cultural heritage the Arpad comes from, they like long <laughs> time. So nothing is done quickly and you know. But this time it works by miracle because there was uh, another show that didn't happen, another project that the uh, Goethe Institute was working on and didn't happen so we managed to get in and it's, it's fantastic. It's so good to see this work here. I'm really excited. So, thanks to Connie for giving the space. Thanks to the Goethe Institute and Albert for helping out with bringing the two fantastic artists. And thank you for coming. To the Hava. Thanks, Moshe. I would like to invite Arpad, and uh, there's a bit of a, a huge story between Arpad and me. Arpad has come to Sydney three, four years ago, right? Four years, yeah. Four years. And at the time when we met, that was when Klaus Krischok uh, was on his way out after a long, long time in Australia. Mm -hmm. And Arpad's wife, Alex, and uh, blessings to her and greetings to her, even though she's not present, she was highly pregnant, and it was the German Film Festival, just when you arrived, and she, she was giving birth to an Aussie. And guess what? They are leaving in about three, four weeks to go to Stockholm for good. It's his last speech tonight. I'm a bit sort of touched. Oh. <laughs> we really got to love each other. And uh, his wife, again, has given birth to another Aussie a few days ago. Yeah. So they 
will never forget Australia. You know what I mean, <laughs> right? Two kids here. That's right. Two two Aussies and um, that well, that's really fantastic. And I also want to make a bit of promotion here. Thank you. The German Film Festival is starting next week, next Wednesday, I think. So if you are interested in some German film with subtitles, of course. Uh, there's a little brochure here for the um, for the festival, and at that stage, I also would like to thank uh, the consul general, Mr. Steinbach, who has given some of the wine here today as well. Oh. He couldn't be here. He couldn't be here because the Sebit is going on, and the deputy Anne Kirsten, she's in Germany, so That's right. uh, they are shining with their absence, but the okay. wine is here. <laughs> It's your right. turn, Arthur. So finish, finish off the wine quickly so they can send some more. <laughs> well, you've mentioned, you've mentioned that we, um, true Germans in total synchronicity, the cultural programming and the making of babies are all in tune. The uh, timing is precise. We call it Vorsprung durch Technik. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I'm very grateful to my little daughters. Um, because they waited patiently. Their due date was three years ago, the opening night of the Audio Festival of German Films, and this time around it was the due date for the media launch. And Connie, Moshe, you know how busy we get during media launches and all the hype, the festival madness. Anita, Connie, Moshe, I'm so grateful to you guys. Total synchronicity also means, you know, there has to be some electricity, good vibes, other, otherwise these shows would never happen. We have a lot of red tape, we've got lots of bureaucracy, you mentioned that correctly, which always trying to get rid of it, but we're sitting up to here in bureaucracy and still trying to swim around. But we make things happen, fortunately, and we've got two fantastic, fantastic artists. I remember very, very clearly the day when Moshe, you, you, you approached me and we were you know, having another yearly planning session, what shall we do together, I like that on, you know, I admire your work, and Anita and you, you're great movers and shakers, and you really rock this city with this huge festival of photography, and I'm grateful. to Dahaba, you deserve a special round of applause. And during that planning, you discuss this artist, that artist, and you mentioned the tears that you shed, Art can bring about tears, it can hit you like a sledgehammer. That's what art maybe is supposed to do, to get you out of, you know, to broaden your horizon, to confront you, to inspire you, but also to shake you up, to open up your mind and to, to touch you somewhere that no one else has touched you before. And I'll start with Daniel Schumann's work. Where are you? There, there. You're from Düsseldorf, educated at Volkswangschule, highly decorated with grants, awards, lots of shows, highly acclaimed. And Daniel spent a year in a hospice. Everyone who has a family member knows what that means. It's the ultimate station. It is very unlikely once we enter a hospice we will ever make it out of it. It's like intensive care unit, you know, your chances are very, very slim. And once you've reached a certain age, chances are even slimmer. It has happened, but it's not very likely. And there's one thing we share, all of us, all humans do. We push it aside, we never talk about it. We never talk about the fears and what is coming next after that stage. We, it's a taboo, really. It's a taboo. It's death. We will all die, that is for certain. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know whether we'll be in total solitude or whether we'll be surrounded by loved ones. We don't know whether it's going to be painful, we don't know whether it's peaceful. We simply don't know what's next and we don't know what, what will happen the moment after. This magnificent series that Daniel has made over a year, he has asked the people, you see, whether they would like to be free. And the series is called Purple, Grey, Black, and Blue. No, almost. Purple, Brown, Grey, White, Black. <laughs> you, would never, you would have never imagined why, why he's come up with the colors. This lady over there with the purple um, jumper, she's 
she was changing jumpers during the time that Daniel approached her and they started to talk and started to exchange views and talked about this and that and he got to know her and she changed jumpers and they had certain colors and her colors, the jumper, the, 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 the colors of the jumpers gave the series the title. I looked at these photos, Moishe, Moishe showed me the, there you are now, how did you make it from here to there? <laughs> I was uh, trying to escape. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> you see, you see, my Hebrew is not that bad, but it's still he continues to talk in English. I don't know what I can do, you know, a gentle uh, offering free Hebrew classes to the world. And I remember very much when we, when we, talk, when we talked about it, the, the sentiment of mortality and the feelings it, it evokes. I'm very grateful that artists like you, Daniel, bring the topic of our human mortality, because our time is finite, we all know that. But still we push it aside. It's a taboo. Have you been to a dinner discussion recently and people talked happily about their death? I, I have not. I have not. It needs artists to bring it to the table. I'll stop right there, but I'll, 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 finish, I'll finish what I have to say about Daniel's work with one quote. I wrote a little, you know, I'm, I'm a German, I like to be prepared. I wrote down four pages. <laughs> I'll, put, I'll put them back. But one, one quote I, I, will, I would like to, to add to this opening night is by Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher. And he said, death speaks to us in the mode of silence. And look at these images, and you know what I'm, I'm talking about. Death, death can be also a relief. If you look at them, how peaceful they are. Maybe, maybe it's even something to look forward to. For Martin Heidegger, the quote in Being and Time, it was not something to be afraid of, but to, to deal with, you know, to wrestle it down, the idea that our, our existence is finite. Thomas, he's from Siegen, also highly acclaimed, showered with exhibitions, um, awards, grants, and international recognition. We are very, very fortunate to have you two here, and I'm grateful you made it all the way to Australia. I'm very grateful that Goethe could support you. And Thomas is so busy that like 200 days in a year, he's on a traveling show. He's, this man is highly in demand, highly in demand. And what you see here tonight in this beautiful backstage Connie Dietschold gallery, are the wonders of the world. He's taken you on a worldwide tour. But, like a true good artist, he presents the things you seemingly know in a totally new way. His world is fractured. It's all about monuments. They are static, but he shakes them up. And you have to talk to Tom Thomas and let him explain how what his working method is. It's to totally exciting, it's totally, totally exciting. And you see places that we Germans are very familiar with, the Reich Reichstag. I've been there, I'm from Berlin, but I've never seen it like this. Thank you for opening, opening up my horizon. And this is Castle Neuschwanstein. This is Disney, Disneyland in Germany, long before Disneyland was even invented. <laughs> it's a bit older, that's right, it's a bit older. But it's like you ne you've never seen it before. It's totally fractured and assembled, reassembled. I'll stop right here. I'm truly grateful. I'm grateful to you again. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the art. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Moshe and thank you Arpad for your introduction. Um, we had, uh, would like to acknowledge also Alistair Foster. Um, Alistair who organized uh, an artist talk last night and each artist had one hour to talk about their work. So today I ask you to just talk five minutes. <laughs> and I've already asked them please prepare the essence of the bullet points that are really vital and important. <coughs> So everyone really gets what's behind these works. Um, Arpad already has touched upon something, but that is not all the works that, of course, uh, Daniel has been doing. And, uh, and you also may ask the question, why is it called time frame, and how come both artists work under the same title? Um, 
well, very easy to explain. The time frame here is that uh, the, the China Wall or the Reichstag or the museum or um, the Eiffel, no, not the Eiffel, the Tokyo Tower, Beijing Tower, Beijing Temple, they all have been newly created. And of course, between that and new creation is a, is a time frame. And Thomas will explain to you how he does it. And uh, again, here there is a time frame from until they have left their bodies. So uh, again, a time frame. So we wanted to tackle that topic. So I would like to ask Daniel and Thomas to come up on stage so you can see them. Come with your lovely red shoes. And, uh, and Thomas with his amazing Qantas kangaroo tie. <laughs> Look at it. I mean, can you believe this? Yeah. A German artist in a suit and a tie. Wow. He's done that out of your respect. I, I'm sure it is. And on, I, I have to also say something. Thomas is amazing. The first day he arrived here, he said, I said to him, what are you going to do tonight? He said, I'm a dancer. I'm going to have, I, I'm going to dance up. Every night he's going to dance salsa. You know, and he, yeah, that's what he does. He shakes those women around and is, uh, you know, the man on the floor. And uh, did you go dancing yesterday? No, no, no. You were no, thinking no, here. No, no. I'm shooting this morning. But you were thinking about to continue. Of course. You didn't. Okay. I'm thinking so of we've inspired him to do the Opera House and the, uh, the Harbour Bridge. So that's hopefully the next project. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Daniel for Schumann. Coming. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm very happy that so many people came tonight to see our exhibition opening. And I'm proud to have the chance to exhibit in Sydney, so far away from home. Thank you for Connie to host this show. Thank you, Florian. And uh, thank you, Moshe, to introduce us. Thank you to Alistair. And of course, thank you, Arpad, to also make this exhibition possible. Um, yeah. I am shown in pro a project which, which is actually my first book that I published already um, a couple of years ago. I photographed the series uh, in 2006, but it is a very important project for me. And uh, so, because it's so important, I'm very happy to have the chance to show these pictures again. I would say it's... Um, really a milestone in my career as an artist because it changed my whole way of um, thinking about photography working as an artist. I did my civil service in a hospice in Germany and I never, never really thought in the beginning that I would use this experience uh, for being an artist. At first I just was forced to go there to do the civil service, but later on when I started studying photography, I felt like I really need to go back to this hospice to work on these experiences that I collected. And uh, yeah, these experiences about dying and death really changed my way of thinking about life and thinking as an artist. So I asked the people in the hospice uh, can I come back and work here as a photographer instead of before as a nurse? So I fortunately got the opportunity and came back to photograph for one year to, yeah, on the one hand side, um, show my experiences that I had before from my civil service in pictures, but yeah, to also look at this topic of dying and death from a new point of view, from a more observing point of view, and to bring these experiences in a book and in exhibitions out into the world and to tell about what Arthur already mentioned, that death can, ha can have something very peaceful and of course at some point we all get uh, to deal with this situation. So I photographed here on the very left, Mr. Petersmann, he used to be a principal at a school in Germany. He was a very strict person and 
when he was confronted with death, when he knew I will die soon, he completely changed. When I met him, he was very slick and he, uh, everybody knew he would die in a couple of months. Uh, he was suddenly a very soft person, very open, and he told me that um, he decided to participate in my project because he um, felt like that it is good that somebody uh, who is young, who has not to deal with death, is coming to this hospice to look at how is how are people who are old, who are not attractive anymore, dealing with this really difficult, sad situation. And uh, then there is uh, Ulrike. She asked to be anonymous, so. Um, yeah, only her first name in this case. She used to be an artist and uh, she was a dance teacher and then she um, got sick, suffered from ALS, which is a muscle weakness. So um, she yeah, was uh, very unhappy, had a lot of struggle with her illness. So. Um, she told me one day that she was actually using my pictures to tell her children how she was feeling. So what it meant to her to be sick, to not be not able anymore to move, to dance. And um, when you're looking in the book about this project that is lying back there, you can see that I photographed her over the period of one year. and. I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to photograph her for such a long time and that she has been so open to give so much to me and to my project. Um, yeah, so I photographed this whole pro project over the period of one year. I met in total nine people that I photographed. Some, this guy here, the one in the middle, only for one week. I still had the chance that he told me a lot about his life, about his experiences. He was very much into carnival. He uh, was a very lively person. He liked to flirt with uh, women a lot. And he was happy that he was, on the day when he was born, the only man while 11 other women were born in Cologne. <laughs> so he was very proud about this. and. Um, yeah, during my project I got um, in touch with very interesting people, with very individual stories of life, and of course all of these had very um, yeah, individual ways of dealing with this. Some died peaceful, others had really to fight, but um, I'm trying to tell with this whole project that um, yeah, it is possible to say goodbye in peace and freedom um, yeah not really yeah also freedom but mostly peace and um, so yeah I hope that this project helps on the one hand side the people I photograph but also people who are looking at my pictures. There are other projects that he did, and I think this may be something for the future, Daniel. He photographed yes. uh, in San Francisco gay couples, how they became families, adopted children, etc. So this would be, of course, uh, a much lighter topic for <laughs> Sydney. And I also, at this stage, would like to uh, acknowledge Carla, who has come with Daniel. She is from San Francisco. This is where they met, and since then they're together. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, over thanks. to Thomas. Uh, well, I joined the row of uh, thanks to Elisa, Anita, Moshe, Ava, Connie, and uh, especially you too. Oh, thank I you. want to thank you for this wonderful, wonderful event with a special edition. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, what to say? Um, when I studied photography, I was also a painter, and I was longing for something to be different. 
I had one teacher in a sculpture installation who explained to me what art is. And he said, everything that you can see with your eyes has nothing to do with art. You have to create it. It has to be something new. So I looked at my camera and I thought, well, so everything that I see through my shutter is nothing new. It does exist already. So my solution was going into pinhole cameras, alternative <coughs> processes, uh, creating my own cameras, and I got completely intrigued with the possibility of multiple perspectives. The singular perspective, what we know as a central perspective, is an idea that is as old as Renaissance. Fine art has overcome that completely. We are today talking about completely abstract artworks, like Connie represents a lot of these artists who do concrete art with color only, with the material only. Photography is still st stuck, in my opinion, in a, a central perspective. There's many artists who work on that, especially uh, in the past few years, you find a lot of works that go in the direction of object and, and uh, individual objects. I wanted to create something that was connected to, this, to the history in art. And my studies were in Cubism. And when I was invited to Paris, of course, I wanted to do something that was comparable to the Eiffel Towers of Robert Delaunay. I had no time to create my pinhole camera, and I thought, okay, I do a little sketch with a contact print. And the, this contact print turned out totally beautiful. I did a series, and it took two years to understand that I found uh, a miracle. I found a wonder that does not happen so often. Photography is very limited in this viewer, and what you can do, you create. And I found something new, no one had done before me, creating a whole series in oeuvre through the contact sheet, talking about movement within the image, close to cubism, some talk it's about deconstruction, others say it's reconstruction, some have called me a futurist or an expressionist. And since then, I'm working in a series about architecture, and uh, have this stable construction just shaking their bodies. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of fun, the people have a lot of fun. And what you see here is a series that probably will take me a whole lifetime to photograph the wonders of the world. Whenever I have a chance, like coming to Sydney, with your help, Papa, thank you very much, I can do another building. And this is usually as it's once a year. This year is very, very slow. Because I cannot afford so many travels as he said. It's, it's very rare. <laughs> yes, I remember two years that I was so in demand. But other years, like the North Rheinstein Castle, I could do only that travel 300 kilometers in Germany, uh, not more. Um, because there was no show, no money, nothing. I make my living on a printer. What you see here is a result of probably 10 years. A few of the examples in the series that I call Tango Metropolis. The most important pictures that I have taken in that world. I want to add one thank you, and then I'm finished. Thank you to Daniel for being a wonderful colleague in China and here together with me in this exhibition. Thank you very much. How you do this? Because you will not, you will, you cannot imagine this. Yes. This is not done digitally. When you hear ten years, you must think, oh my God, ten years, right? What? There's many artists among you here. What do you create in ten years? So, if that is ten years' work, what's the process? Because. Um, okay, I can say that. Please, I do. Yes. <laughs> you want to know it again? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> the pictures. When you get close, you see these, these black grids. And 
some of you might be digital natives already, uh, so you don't know that material anymore. It's a 35 millimeter film.